The Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Athens, as well as the regional office in Sarajevo for Southeastern Europe, uh, is delighted to cooperate with the Institute of International Economic Relations and particularly with Blamen Tonchev on the subject of Chinese soft power in this region. This cooperation was not planned as a digital event or a video production. It was planned as an old school conference in Athens, but for the reasons everyone knows, we were forced uh, into the digital and uh, we hope that we can reach you with this uh, little video uh, on the main findings of this study. The report China's soft power in Southeast Europe, authored by Plamen Tonchev, senior research fellow at the Institute of International Economic Relations, and published by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, points out the toolkit used by Benching and the patterns emerging across the region. In addition, the report looks at the effectiveness of China's soft power campaign and expectations in Southeast European countries. An important conclusion which derives from the report is that China sells better in the Southeastern Europe region than in other parts of Europe, where anti-Chinese sentiment is becoming more pronounced and translates into growing resentment for an even confront confrontation with China. First and foremost, I would like to commend Mr. Plum and Tonchev on his excellent study, which provides a detailed and very comprehensive account of China's soft power in Southeast Europe. In writing this report, which has been a fascinating exercise, I started out with uh, Joseph Nye's definition of soft power. And I then went through a long list of um, complementary definitions, more than 170, I think. But the best definition of soft power that I've come across um, is actually to be found in a film. The well-known comedy Love Actually, which is a feel-good Christmas movie. Um, People have seen it and may remember that Hugh Grant was the British Prime Minister in that movie. Um, in one of my favourite scenes, he gives a press statement and says that um, the United Kingdom is not a big country, but it's a great country. Because this is a country that's given the world um, Shakespeare, Churchill, uh, the Beatles, Sean Connery, uh, Harry Potter and David Beckham's right foot. Of course, it's a comedy. It's meant to be funny. But I think that this definition actually provides the essence of what soft power stands for. What makes a country popular relates to a large extent uh, to its history, renowned artists and intellectuals, political figures who embody the core values of that nation, famous athletes, pop culture, um, lifestyle, these are the things that make a country attractive and livable. So I ask myself, uh, is this China's case? Well, that's not my impression. While there's a lot of respect for Chinese civilization and the achievements of this country over the past 40 years, one of my key findings is that modern China is not really popular with people in the Balkans. Despite the expanding presence of Chinese uh, Confucius Institutes, uh, classrooms, cultural centers and whatnot, most young people in Southeast uh, Europe yearn to study in the West and to work in the West, not in China. And it's not just living standards and career opportunities thereafter. It's also that they think highly of Western lifestyle and sense of freedom, among other things. But then comes my second key finding, that China actually sells quite well in the Balkans compared to other parts of Europe. And this is a glaring contradiction, isn't it? Uh, the only plausible explanation I've come up with is that China's popularity across the region has little to do with appeal. It primarily concerns the expectations that East European nations 
could benefit from Chinese investment capital and business acumen? Um, one of the features of Chinese soft power is the focus on culture and education, uh, which I believe it's not uh, very efficient for two reasons. First, because the difference between the Western Balkans and China, the cultural difference is very big. The cultural gap is very big. And second, because um, their best examples of involvement in Western Balkans, it's in economy, in the FDI. But uh, this requires for much bigger research effort to understand how those Chinese companies that, are, that have been present in the Western Balkans during those last years are doing, what is their perception in the local population, in the local communities, what's their impact in the environment, in the economic development of the area, in the salaries of the people, in the work uh, relationship. And uh, this is really what we have to understand to better get or grasp the impact of the Chinese soft power in the region. So we have to bear in mind that for China, this is the learning process. It departed from its domestic PR uh, strategy and tried to export it to the rest of the world. Sometimes it may look clumsy or involve a lot of mistakes, but it is improving by the day. And uh, take, for example, the, the state-centric approach. Once China believed that it is enough to work with the state institutions, when it realized that the state does not control everything in our part of the world, they started a charm offensive with universities, local governments, media, and even NGOs. Another example would be the use of Facebook and Twitter accounts by Chinese embassies in the region, which was not the case only several months ago. So, in the end, we must conclude that uh, this for China is a learning process and that China admit that China is a very good at learning. We're working in a region where uh, traditionally the two blocks, the East and the West, uh, Russia and the US, uh, were uh, often in the past confronting each other and uh, into this uh, particular situation since years, there is the new emerging big global power coming into uh, what is China, um, gaining influence in this region mainly by uh, their large uh, investments into uh, key uh, sectors uh, like infrastructure and transport, like energy and telecommunication in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative on their way to Western Europe. The way China projects its soft power is a mix of economic prowess and hyperactive, at the times overbearing, public diplomacy. There's education, there are some scholarships, um, there's a flurry of um, cultural activities, and of course presence in the media, which is very often uh, orchestrated by the Chinese embassies in the region. But as I argue in the report, Southeast Europeans are not bewitched by China, far from it. The real reason why political and business elites in the region are willing to work with China is Beijing's checkbook diplomacy and the Chinese way of doing business, with no questions asked. This differs quite a bit from the stringent requirements imposed by the EU with regard to fair competition, environmental protection, labour safety, uh, financial sustainability and so on. It is next to impossible to extricate China's soft power from its economic statecraft. To such an extent that if one sifts through Chinese presence in the Balkans, what will remain in the end is Chinese money for infrastructure projects. That's what it's about. That's what Southeast Europeans expect. That's what makes China welcome in the region. But again, I would call this lukewarm acceptance by necessity, rather than a genuine and emotional embrace. At the same time, there's China's charm offensive amidst the coronavirus pandemic, with the sale of medical supplies occasionally masked as donations. But these medical supplies are really very much needed and appreciated which definitely allows Beijing to score political points in the region. And it's a qualitatively new approach on the part of China to display its generosity, 
possibly as an emerging component of Beijing's soft power strategy. Inadvertently, the corona pandemic helped China achieve much better results in terms of soft power than years of public diplomacy and heavy investments. It was China that was often invoked as the true friend of um, our country. But even prior to the pandemic, China enjoyed a rather positive reputation in the whole region. Although there is a very limited uh, public debate on China-related issues, national media have uh, limited coverage on China-related events, even when national officials attend, and the original production of China-related items is limited to cultural and travel shows, which present China in a very shiny light. However, we should not overstate uh, the effects of China's soft power. A big portion of the population is not familiar with China-led initiatives such as the Belt and Road or the 17 plus 1 cooperation. In addition, China uh, remains uh, physically and what is even more important, culturally too distant to be considered an alternative to the EU, uh, which remains a strategic destination for most countries in the region. Western Balkan countries uh, have been used to hard power and also to propaganda. Uh, during the last 25 years, our uh, politicians have become masters also in soft power. Uh, they know very well how to send messages, how to work with uh, emotions and also with uh, how the different masses and also international partners can be impacted. For example, here I want to use the a case of uh, Albanian PM when uh, he sent 30 medical doctors and uh, nurses in Italy to help with the coronavirus. His message went viral and was covered in all the international media. It was a very nice exercise in soft power. Uh, exactly the same thing or similar was used by the president uh, of Serbia when he kissed the Chinese flag when receiving a cargo plane full of medical supplies only two weeks ago. So when discussing about uh, big China that uses soft power to poor and unprotected uh, Western Balkan countries, it's a bit simplistic. Uh, small countries can also use uh, uh, their soft power as well. But it's not only investment and it's not only economic cooperation. The soft power what is uh, employed by China in this region is a very important factor as well in shaping its future role here. And uh, the study of Plamen is uh, examining uh, the tools of this uh, cooperation and uh, gives further information about uh, the uh, uh, actually circumstances uh, China is working in this region. I think we will see development on this because uh, during this pandemic, uh, China developed as well its cooperation on medical equipment and assistance with countries in need, what is definitely shaping as well its image, its relation and partnership and its influence in the future in this region. And this is something what we want to uh, investigate further once uh, this pandemic and uh, this crisis caused by coronavirus will be over. Connectivity agenda, it's a, a potential and uh, I believe optimal meeting points of uh, China and European Union here in the Western Balkans. Uh, our transport and energy networks are designed as an extension of the European Union once. On the other side, we need a lot of investment massive amount of investments to bring those uh, networks up to the standards of the EU and at the same time support local growth so that we can achieve the convergence targets for our countries to be uh, full member states. This is a very important condition. So um, Chinese capital and this uh, their attitude of entering into sectors that are not interesting for the European Union uh, companies can be uh, an advantage point for all the parties. Coming from North Macedonia myself, I believe that March 2020 was a truly historic month for my country. After 15 years, we received green light from the EU to open accession talks 
and we also became a NATO member. However, both events were somewhat eclipsed from the eyes of ordinary people because of the corona pandemic and the debate was centered on masks, testing kits and respirators. In this light, uh, unsurprisingly, China was the hero of the day, especially after EU's ban on the exports of medical supplies, which left China as the only alternative, not only for donations, but also for uh, purchase. Ironically, I have to say, it was actually EU's financial contribution that was used to buy Chinese medical supplies. Balkan nations crave to be an integral part of Europe, closely interconnected with the EU through transport, uh, infrastructure and energy networks, and just as importantly, uh, on a par with EU member states in political and economic terms. At the same time, they are acutely aware of the fact that the region is often looked down upon as the continent's dark underbelly. It's not just living standards which are lower than uh, in most other European economies, nor merely the fact that the Western Balkans are still outside the European Union. The whole of Southeast Europe as a region, with very few exceptions, has a largely negative image due to the systemic rule of law deficiencies, corrupt elites and increasingly authoritarian governments, Serbia being very much a case in point. Given this complicated relationship, there's a deeply entrenched perception in Southeast Europe, rightly or wrongly, that the region has been left behind by much wealthier Western partners. And it's true that over the past decade, the EU has been in disarray, struggling to make up its mind over the prospects of the Western Balkans. Albania and North Macedonia were recently invited to start pre-accession talks with the EU, which is a very positive development, but not a panacea, and certainly not a shortcut to prosperity and security. It is this gloomy, political setting and psychological void that China is stepping into as an unlikely alternative to the EU.